Hi, Ebony. Hi. <laughs> it's great to see you. <laughs> it's lovely to see you too. How are you dealing with, or how are you coping with lockdown? I mean, I'm coping and not coping. Um, some days are better than others. Um, but I'm quite creative. So I think I'm quite good at finding things to do. And I've found that I've kind of reverted back um, to my childhood in a lot of ways. And I'm doing things now that I used to enjoy doing just for the fun of it, not for some like productivity purpose. So there, there are good and bad bits, really, I think. Well, that's great. Yeah, I can 100% sympathise with you. I'm with you on mm. that. So some days are like, oh, like nothing's really happening and... Um, and actually, in a way, quite relieving without having the social pressure of having to go to places. Mm. But then other days are really not that great and uh, you sort of just have to get through them. Um, so it's great to hear that you found things to do. And even more exciting to see that it's evoked, um, you know, through your creativity and all. So um, just for people who haven't had the pleasure of meeting your lovely self, um, can you just give us like a quick snapshot of, um, in your case, also where you are? Um, mm. Because I think that's quite unique about you in, in terms of the good eggs. Okay, yeah. So right now I am at home with my parents, which is nice. It's great. Um, it's nice not to be on my own. It's probably the reason why I've reverted back to childhood a little bit as well, because I'm with them um, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> but uh, basically, I am a freelancer. I tend to work with writers, journalists, and small businesses. Um, my business kind of divides into two sides. So there's a digital marketing consulting, um, anything from like... Um, creating and defining a strategy to implementing it um, even to like education and supporting smaller businesses um, through kind of doing it by themselves um, and then there's also the editorial side where I tend to work with like journalists writers and authors and give them like a little bit of support in the kind of day-to-day -day, but also the process of writing so I think a lot of people just kind of figure you, you sit down, you write an article and you send it to the editor, but there's so many different phases leading up to the final product. I tend to help with like the research, reporting, um, pitching, all of those kinds of little fiddly bits that go towards the final product. So yeah, varied. <laughs> that's, that's great. So how have you, um, well, how have you been affected over the last, well, have we know eight weeks in or something like that? It's insane, isn't it? It's kind of all merged into one. Um, but yeah, I've been, I've been affected. So I've lost contracts or my workload has kind of lessened with existing clients. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if I'm like hysterically optimistic here. <laughs> but I'm kind of just embracing it. Like uh, everyone's in the same boat. I think that's kind of what the comfort is as well. Like it's not just, it's not the same as like suffering redundancy or just kind of losing your job out of the blue. We are all kind of in this together all of our lives have been changed like in a, in a huge meaningful way so i'm kind of taking comfort in the fact that it's not just me and that we're all going to have to kind of rebuild after this and find kind of um find out how we want to do things post coronavirus as well because i think there's going to be some huge huge changes and some of them welcome no absolutely 100 percent agree with you um and i I think, I, I mean, it goes without saying that the situation is shit for a lot of people. Yeah. I'm not wanting to minimise that. But in a, in a way, I feel like these extreme circumstances have also meant that we've had to take extreme steps that we otherwise would have never taken. So it's almost like pushing you out of the comfort zone. But it's had, for me at least, it has this really nice tinge to it. So it's it's basically allowed me to slow down in order to go faster, if that makes sense. Definitely, yeah. I think I've like reevaluated um, how I view my productivity as well. It's not so much about like uh, how many hours I've worked or what I feel the extent of my output is. It's did I finish the day and do this one thing really, really well, yes or no? Mm -hmm. And for me, that can be like two hours work or it can be 10 hours work. And just being able to assess your productivity, I think, in a more like emotionally fulfilling way, that's really nice. I, I mean, having said that, it's also 
um, we, we can't ignore the negatives here. Like you say, it's um, life changing in really, really awful ways for a lot of people. Um, and living at home with my parents, um, my, my dad has a really rare form of macular degeneration. I've inherited it, but I haven't seen any signs yet. It's kind of like more an age related thing. Um, and living with him has kind of made me more aware of the restrictions that a lot of disabled people were suffering before this pandemic, but also how, how the pandemic has exacerbated this as well. So yeah, it's just, it's been an interesting insight and it's definitely made me more thoughtful. Yeah, no, I, that's a really interesting thought because even though I obviously had the, the cancer last year, um, I'd never seen myself as being disabled, but actually if I look at the facts, I am classed as disabled now and um, and I always thought like oh yeah it's, but it's just small things you know that the fact that I can't move my hand a certain way but then you, it has ripple effects and um, at the moment I mean I'm lucky because my immune system seems to have kicked back in but my my um, the things that I can't there are still things I can't do one of them being I can't go to hospital tomorrow which is really upset me um because my checkups is are really really important but because they're too worried about me catching this they've now had to call me and said no if 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 there's nothing pressing please stay at home um which is you know great that there's nothing pressing at the moment but at the same time I'm like Ah. absolutely it's like it's, it's paradoxical as well isn't it because I think as much as we are kind of all in this together we're not all in this in the same way and people are going to have really different experiences depending on like disability or socioeconomic class or all of those things are really kind of filtering in right now and it is hopefully drawing attention to some of those inequalities so that post coronavirus we can we can make it a better world for everyone yeah absolutely I mean the whole benefit system Although I'm so, so I was so hopeful when they came out that it was um, <laughs> Mr. Hancock who said, "Oh no, no one could survive on this." And I was like, "Oh, he said it, you know, he admitted it." Um, and now I can already yeah. see the reverting and going, "No, no, we have to wean people off furlough." And I was like, "Oh, here we go again." But I, I hope that as a as a society, um, it will help us to keep the systems in um um how do you say them um keep them you know keep challenging them for change yes oh, yeah. keeping them accountable that's the word i was looking for absolutely um, yeah the one thing i am a bit worried though because um obviously lockdown is easing a bit as well which is great and you know in in measure if we can keep with it but I'm just a little bit worried that uh, me and my fellow disabled people are just going to be forgotten about and we're going to be locked up forever. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to have to organise an event where I'm on screen and all of you guys are there in 3D and, and do that. Or, um, or maybe just pop on a face mask or something. But I, I honestly, I hope this one day we'll all be able to get back out together. Absolutely. So. I, I need a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so one of the questions I've been asking, um, because in the media everyone was talking about the bookshelf as the background, um, and I wanted to ask each Good Egg entrepreneur what type of books have either influenced them or shaped them, or even if that's a too big a question, what you are reading at the moment, and we are including podcasts in that because I know not everyone has time to read. <laughs> Okay, so um, I've got a couple here. I even brought my props. Uh, <laughs> <woo>! <laughs> so these are ones that I've actually read um, over the period of lockdown. Um, I have been moving more into nonfiction uh, just because I feel like reading is a really nice way to kind of passively learn a thing. And it's like merging that kind of enjoyment, but also you're getting something out of this. This is me over optimizing. Like <laughs> but uh, the first one I've got is this one yeah everybody everybody writes yeah um and it's uh, a little bit dog-eared now um but i'm not much of a writer but writer is writing is part of my job you know i write kind of shorter form um copy for social media um and i just figured i could do with a bit more of a method and science for it 
Um, and it's a really good book for kind of breaking down um, a lot of the questions you should be asking yourself when you're writing. Mm -hmm. And like now, when I'm writing post reading this book, I'm kind of thinking, yeah, but why does this matter? And who am I actually trying to talk to here? And like, do I need all of those words? Um, so yeah, it's just been a really, really helpful book. And it's so easy to read as well. Like I know a lot of books like that can be quite draining, um, mm -hmm. but it's just a really great read. Um, and then the other one I've been reading more for fun is The Body by Bill Bryson. Ah, uh, that's, that's one of the top sellers, isn't it? It keeps coming up on my yeah. audio. It's a chunky book. It is chunky, but do you know what? I've made such quick progress through this. I'm usually like, if I read fiction, um, I can read it in a night. If I read nonfiction, it's like a month because um, I like to commit myself to kind of taking everything in. Um, but it's a brilliant book. Um, and I think right now it's a really nice time to kind of like go into yourself and think about just how your body works and appreciate how like awesome it is. Um, and it's just been a really nice book for that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I love those two books. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, and you're really right about the whole body science thing. We, we don't actually, as in general knowledge terms, don't know enough about it unless obviously you studied it. So that might be... <laughs> <laughs> But like normal humans and when I am um, because I've had to um, had to communicate with pro professional medical people over the last year and I've realized that I have to slightly change my language in order to ask the questions and then also interpret what is saying being said back and it's really weird that you said that at the moment because um I, this is not planned by the way it just happened to be there but well, mostly because I was prepping for my appointments this week but I am um, I for the first time uh, researched like how my cancer came about and I was going to take this in <laughs> to check if I understood because I had to read like proper medical text and I was yeah. like what <laughs> and, I to, and yeah so mm. this this is basically how it happened so it was a virus, which didn't look anything like the coronavirus, but I knew now how to draw viruses that then had a go at my mm. DNA. My DNA then, um, the, the cells it produces, they were a bit wonky, but I, my immune system normally takes care of that. And then just one went, just floated through the security net and then became a nice tumour. Um, and I also found out that... Um, so this, this virus, 80% of the population have a virus like this and only 1% of that 80% have this particular V6, 11 or 18, which can cause the cancer. But then again, only 1% of those actually get the cancer. So it made me feel really special because I thought, wow. Very special. <laughs> There really aren't many people. So you say why? I did the maths, and I am not saying this is right because when Barbara does maths, normally it's not quite correct. <laughs> um, it came up with like four thousand people over the lifetime. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that's it's insane. Um, yeah, so I said to my other half, going like, hmm, I would have had better chances of winning the lottery. No, aren't we lucky? <laughs> <laughs> it makes you realize doesn't it how like a finely tuned thing the body is like and there's all of these variables and it just really boils down to a tiny tiny weeny change tiny tiny i mean it's so so insignificant it's like growing an extra hair somewhere you know it's just mm. absolutely tiny and then even more i thought about like how much i've abused my body over the 33 years I've been about by eating either crap or not exercising or drinking and doing other fun stuff <laughs> <laughs> and then go like oh wow it's actually quite amazing that you know not not more goes wrong on a regular basis so um yeah no it's sort of given me re real different insight but um yeah now I must check that book out absolutely so we, we've come to the point in our call when I pull out my random jar <laughs> and it is random um i do repeat this every time and um, i wrote these a couple of years ago so i can't actually remember what's in there and the other week i pulled one out when i, was, I looked at it and i thought i was definitely pissed when i wrote this <laughs> so um, we'll have to see what comes so i'll just 
pull one up. Da -da -da. Ah, okay. Uh, what questions would you like to ask a time traveler from 200 years in the future? Ah, uh, 200 years? Um, are we out of lockdown yet? <laughs> Question number one. <laughs> <laughs> um, ah, I think, do you know what something that really interests me is like um, whether we'll still be using the same kind of governmental formats across the world? Like, will there be a universe government, government of space? Or is, is the whole idea of a government going to change? I'm really interested in a lot of these things about like how um, the world will work on that kind of structural level. Um, the same with currency, like, will we go back to like three goats for um, a spaceship? Or <laughs> that seems very cheap to me. But <laughs> well, we don't know how rare goats are gonna be. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I think, um, especially right now it's illustrated how a lot of our structures don't really work and that like you said earlier we we should question them or we should challenge them mm -hmm. um so i would be interested to see like if for instance borders work the same way countries work the same way will we become citizens of the earth or just british <laughs> I really love that question. And actually, I'm going to make a recommendation at this point because I stumbled over it um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, a lovely, the lovely Lauren, um, uh, Lauren um, Razavi made this recommendation. It's a podcast and it's called, sorry, my, my memory is obviously great as I have to look up a podcast <laughs> I literally 10 minutes ago. It's called Reimagine is the name of the whole podcast series and Make the episode specifically that really got me hooked on it is called rebel economics mm. and it, it very much follows that line of questioning it also um has um another episode on beyond greenwashing which is about sustainability um, and basically reimagine is a podcast series that's um all about social entrepreneurs and how they are going to change the world um, in the near future um, and it was it was meant to launch about now anyhow but then they had to launch early because of the coronavirus and the first couple of episodes are really coronavirus centered um, and they're really interesting really thought-provoking and actually in a in a time when you know my social media feeds look questionable and the news looks questionable and it's all a bit uh, it's a real glimmer of hope and it, it's a real sort of visionary view of how the world could look beautiful in the future and, and harmonic and, you know, everything that us libertarians love about. <laughs> <laughs> about. But no, it was, it's really, really thought provoking. And um, yeah. So what, what are your what what are your thoughts in terms of what governments could look like in 200 years? Are you more thinking down the line it's gonna it's gonna break in a way that it all goes into anarchy and unruly, or do you think it's more something more subtle like what we're experiencing now that's gonna drive change? I think we're possibly talking more devolution. Um, that's definitely something I believe in. Um, actually, recently, just before we went into lockdown, I became a parish councillor. Uh, in the village I live yeah hey, hey, hey. <laughs> um yeah I just went to a meeting um and asked lots of questions and they were like come and join us and I was like okay and I did my interview and etc etc but um I think the wonderful thing I'm learning locally um is I, I'm in a small village I'm in Hopton and I'm right on like the beach uh, it's beautiful uh, it's quite quiet um and what I'm learning is a lot of the businesses that have supported the people throughout this pandemic and supplied them with, you know, the bits and pieces they need, the, the services they need, um, are the smaller businesses, are the independent businesses. It's like that, that smaller supply chain. It's um, literally a shorter supply chain. Um, and also the people just really care because it's their community. It's kind of as simple as that. Um, 
and a lot of the businesses we've been using we've been using a lot of smaller businesses to get um our food and get all of the necessities um and it's just been a really different more personal more valuable experience like it's been nicer than just rushing off to tesco's um so i think for me government is i would like to see it become more devolved i would like to see smaller communities kind of taking care of their own communities but also working together in a more overarching way and saying you know we're really working with this idea it's great why don't you guys give it a shot and trying to replicate some of the things that really work in those smaller communities as well i would love to see that because i think the communities understand their people best don't they because they're there yeah absolutely and i agree with you um but then you have this massive um opposite where when we look at global trouble issues like climate change um well climate change being the main <laughs> one that's going to really uh, and the global pandemic sort of goes hand in hand and, and healthcare and, and all of that mm. uh, you it, it almost needs both of it both of them but to work in tandem together um definitely one of the things I really liked about that podcast that I mentioned, it was um, it introduced the donut um, economics. I don't know if you heard of or read about it. it might ring I feel like it rings a bell. Yeah. So basically, at the moment, we are all focused on con con continuous growth, which is not a way um, that will sustain us for, for much longer. Um, mm. as we are using um, all resources available to us and more. Um, but the um, the donut economics sort of looks at um, so basically you have an inner circle and an outer circle. The outer circle being the boundaries of the um, the, the 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 stuff available to us, so resources. But then the inner boundary it means that the human need being met. So like basic income, basic, being able to live somewhere, being able to have food, being, mm. have, uh, having opportunities, education. So no one should be in the middle of the hole and fall out of the donut. But at the same time, we shouldn't use up too much resources to be outside of the donut. Otherwise we are sort of, yeah, messing around with, with our ecosystem and world and everything. And it's really, really interesting. So instead of um, focusing on growth and being bigger and better at everything, it's about having this balance between the two, um, which um, apparently, apparently is really radical. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, probably the most actually is that, that all, you know, all the, the people that are in power and making the rules think this is really radical thinking. I just would have thought, well, balance seems to be a very good thing in life all round. Absolutely. And I think right now a lot of people are kind of evaluating, OK, so what do I miss most? It's probably not an iPhone upgrade. Like it's not. It's giving you Nana a hug. <laughs> no. yeah. yeah, I love that. It's not an iPhone upgrade. <laughs> Yeah, I had that thought the other day. I said because we, I know you can sort of meet up one to one. Mm. To Nick, oh god, if I met up with my mates, then like I, I just would want to go over and hug them. Yes, yeah. Um. So yeah, all my my niece and my nephew. I don't. I think it'd be worse for me to see them, and not being able to touch and hug them than actually. Yeah, although I'm going to have to do that at some point. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's the human experience, isn't it, that we are missing. Definitely. I just hope we hang on to that thought afterwards as well and remember what we are saying right now. Good job you're recording. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Right, we've got, we've got another five minutes, so I'm going to pull out cool. another one. Good job. Okay, this might, I might have been slightly tipsy with this one, um, or definitely watched too many thrillers. <laughs> if you were in a witness protection program, what would you be, uh, what would be your new name and where would you go? Oh, geez. I almost feel like you need a cocktail in order to answer the question. Yeah, I also like, I, I get lazy with names because I'm like, I'm Ebony Storm. Like I would ever have to think about. That's <laughs> <laughs> awesome, yes. I mean, why would I ever change your name? It's so awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah, I feel like I would have to do, um, I would have to play with the whole weather name theme and be slightly ironic and funny just in case people kind of recognize me. Um, so it would probably be something like uh, Luna Sunshine. That would be my name. Nice. nice. Um, I think I would disappear to Paris and become like a very much film noir, femme fatale, going everywhere in tiny black dresses and having lots of money but no one knowing how and appearing at these cool jazz clubs with like a long cigarette. Yeah. That's amazing. That's <laughs> amazing. You know what? I think I might just organise an event just so around that person. Um, just so we can see you as um, Luna Sunshine because that's <laughs> such an awesome vision. <laughs> Can we please? Can that please be the first event back? I'll hold you to it. Uh, give me a bit more time because I will need funding for that. So, <laughs> yeah. so let's wait till people have some money again. But then yeah. after that, I'm with you. <laughs> well, Emily, it's been such a lovely to catch up with you. Um, such, such a bright sunshine. Uh, thank you so much and um, I hope to see you very soon again with cocktail in hand, surrounded by all the good egg entrepreneurs, having a good old laugh um, and uh, yeah, with in, in outfit, of course. Of course. I can't wait. It's been an absolute joy and it's lovely to see you. Uh, thank you so much. You Bye. take care. You too. Bye. <laughs>